like ASL interpreters, and it's really great. Uh, you know, folks can just pin the interpreter. Um, or if you get nauseous watching people bounce around in the green squares, you can just pin them. I like seeing everybody's faces, so it's nice to have, uh, I, you know, it's nice to have the faces on my screen. I'm used to training in person when it's not COVID, so. Um, uh, and then also too, because it is uh, being recorded, um, if you would like to ask the question, you're welcome to ask out loud. You're welcome to put it in the chat. You're also welcome to, like in the chat, that won't be recorded, but you, you can also direct message um, either Ken and I, and we will say the question without you, without naming you. And that way you'll have some anonymity of that. Um, so I, I like to offer that up. Um, so uh, again, my name is Becky Reitzes. I work for Public Health Seattle King County. I have been with the county since uh, 2001. Um, I, I'm a lead trainer and educator with the county, and I've been working on the COVID, uh, what we call our COVID mitigation response team since March 1st. Um, actually, we are we just hit our year anniversary of our first COVID death here in King County, so not a happy anniversary. Um, and my first what we called redeployment because I work for the government. <laughs> My first redeployment was actually answering. Um, we had a, a phone line that we set up specifically for uh, families of the life care center because they were not getting the support they needed. And so we set up a phone line to help to help um, and try to answer questions and support them when where we could. And so that was actually my first um, my first redeployment. And then I've been working with uh, our community mitigation response and the this. Uh, speakers Bureau since, um, among many other things, small business task force, lots of other things. So I um, I say that to say, you know, I've been I've been doing this for a long time now um, with COVID, and so I'm happy to answer questions today. I was asked to come specifically talk about the vaccine. I'm going to also talk about the variant strains. I have a PowerPoint. I don't personally care about my PowerPoint. I care about you all getting your questions answered. Um, I also want to acknowledge that not all my answers are going to be satisfactory. And that's been the entire time of COVID. So uh, I just, you know, recognize that um, is definitely part of this work. So um, moving, oh, you know what I, I think if I updated this, and I think I did. So, um, you know, we're going to talk about, mm, 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 nope, I left one thing in that I didn't mean to leave in. So we're not going to talk about phase two, but I'm happy to talk about phase two if you want. But uh, I was told y'all like some numbers, y'all like a deep information. I was given like a big list of things. So we're going to try to cover, you know, what we can. Also ask questions when we, as we go. We're going to look at where we stand currently in King County. Um, we're going to talk about the vaccine itself. I know folks have had a lot of questions about the vaccine. I'm happy to dive in as deep or as shallow as you would like. I brought a deep dive on this presentation and I can also, if y'all know it already, then we can pull back and just answer other questions that come up. Um, I did wanna mention the variant strains and how they, um, and what we know about them and the vaccine and, you know, uh, show you the resources that we have available on our website. So is that what folks thought they were coming for? I'm looking at faces, see if I get nods. It sounds Cheating. good to me. Thumbs up, smile, <laughs> anything? Thumbs up? All right. Yes. Meredith says yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, so Tim is uh, logging off. Yeah, that's one thing to say. If anyone, for whatever, can't hear, for whatever reason, logging off and on seems to help, oddly enough. All right, cool. I'll dive in. So, um, you know, this is like a basic overview of, of all, we're going to cover all this in this um, conversation, but, you know, where we're at today in King County looks really different than what we were at two months ago, in that I actually get to say cases are declining and metrics are improving. I hate that term because we're actually talking about people, um, but folks also like to hear about numbers, but like things are getting better. They're slow. Um, they are not as good as we'd love them to be, but better is good. Um, and we know that some of this is, is linked to um, vaccine, but a lot of this is linked to people actually doing the prevention mess, like methods that we've been talking about for a year. I'm still amazed sometimes when I see people walking down the street with a mask under their nose, and I'm like, it's been a year. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> yeah, I, can't, I can't tell enough how many times we've talked about this. Um, so the concern, um, as I'm sure you all are aware of, is that we are definitely having um, uh, new strains and these aren't surprising to us. We knew that that was gonna happen, but we can talk about them and what that means. Um, and the big thing is we need to be really diligent, even more so than ever, which is really disappointing to folks, um, but the reality. So we're gonna talk about, um, it, you know, I mentioned we're in phase two still. So um, big thing about phase two is that, you know, indoor gatherings are limited to five people from outside the household and only two households combined and still recommending wearing masks and, and ventilation um, and six feet distance when with people who don't live inside your household and then outdoor is 15 people during phase two um we know that the like most common exposures that people get the way that people get covid is through household transmission so if somebody goes to work they are a essential employee or an employee and they go to work and they come home and they're not you know people in general aren't wearing masks and face coverings and, and they're homes so we can talk about how to help prevent that um, non-healthcare workplaces um, and then healthcare settings and community and social gatherings somebody asked me earlier today you know what do you recommend when it comes to a baby shower and I was like mm, what we would recommend is to do that virtually right uh, so again not having these gatherings because this is definitely where we see especially with someone who's pregnant this is definitely where we see COVID COVID being passed um, and then with the new strains, they're being passed even quicker. And then unfortunately, this is a piece that, that folks are not happy about, um, and neither are we, is that we don't have enough vaccine. Our previous federal administration turned down $1.9 billion of the vaccine. We don't have it. So our vaccine supply is limited to say the least. Um, so we're gonna talk about who can get it uh, and how and when that's all happening. Um, but that is basically when I say that a lot of my answers are not going to be satisfactory. Uh, vaccine supply is one of them. We just don't have it. And hopefully that will be changing. I know our current federal administration um, announced they're buying 200 million doses. So hopefully that will soon be changing. Are there questions on any of this? By the way, I look to my right because I have two screens and I like to see your faces and also my screens. <laughs> so, I, so I look right and left. Also, you'll notice that I will pause when I ask if there's questions. Um, I know that on virtual, it takes a little while to unmute, right? It takes a little while to get there. So I will do some awkward pauses. Um, so I really hate this, this graph. Um, I'm showing it for two reasons. One to say we have all of our data online and we have these wonderful dashboards that you can look up our vaccine data, our um, current data around where we stand in terms of COVID and like how many people test positive and how many, like what's it doing. And one of the things I like about this is I actually get to say, look, things are declining. And that has not, again, I've been doing this for a year, that has not been a typical message I've been able to give. These green circles have not been green, they've been red. So it, it's been, it's nice to say, look, things are actually either flattening or decreasing. We're going the right direction. We're definitely concerned about the new strains, um, but we're headed the right direction. Um, so that part is all, um, is all exciting. And again, you know, we update these almost daily. So uh, pe people can go in. And the nice thing too is you can do it by neighborhood. So if you want to see how many people have been vaccinated in your neighborhood, you can, I mean, not like this block, but in the region you live in, right, your, your city or whatever, um, you can just like look up Shoreline, you can look up, um, uh, you know, Kent and see how many folks have been vaccinated and compare it to how many folks are you know, hospitalized and dying and, and, you know, look at all the different trends on there. So uh, the other thing I like about it is it's all us being super transparent with our information. And we're also taking the state's information and putting it up as well. So um, questions before we jump into the vaccine. All right, let's get into it. So, um, you know, what are the benefits of the COVID-19 vaccine? We, that maybe seems pretty obvious, but folks often say like, well, why would I wanna get this thing? Um, 
So to say it's highly effective in preventing illness, hospitalization, and death from COVID-19, it's way more effective than we ever dreamed it would be. You know, when they started talking about a vaccine, we were thinking maybe 70%, maybe 50%. Um, I mean, I remember hearing Fauci talk, um, Dr. Fauci talk, you know, early on and thinking that would probably be about it. And these vaccines with two, after two doses of the two, so Johnson Johnson was just approved so we don't have it here in our state yet. So I'm gonna talk about Moderna and Pfizer because that's what we actually have. Um, and so the two vaccines, when they are, um, when people get both vaccines, they're about 95% uh, prevented um, from getting, from dying from illness, serious illness, hospitalization for COVID-19. The nice thing about these vaccines is that these two vaccines have also been tested and like included folks from many, many, many different groups. Um, in the studies. And those, obviously, those, I shouldn't say obviously, those folks were all volunteers. Um, and the nice thing is that they did a really great job of recruiting volunteers and, and doing community engagement in really diverse um, vaccines. So there's a question, uh, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are mRNA vaccines. How is the jo Johnson Johnson vaccine different? So the Johnson Johnson is a more typical vaccine that you think about um, the way that vaccines are created versus mRNA technology, which works a little bit differently. Also, the Johnson Johnson is one dose um, and the COVID vaccine is two doses. So that part uh, is a little bit different. You know, it says on how they how it works. Um, they both work in the same way of, of training your body to create antibodies. Um, one uses more traditional technology around um, actually using virus and mRNA uses an mRNA molecule uh, that mimics a protein on the cell to get your, uh, your immune system to recognize uh, COVID. And I'm gonna talk about that in just a second so I can explain the mRNA technology a little bit better than that in just a minute. Um, but I do want to make sure to say, you know, I get a lot of questions like, hey, I have high blood pressure, I have diabetes, I have asthma, you know, is this safe for me? Are these safe? How do you know? Um, do they work the same, you know, for me and my partner who's this size? Like, are you sure it's going to be okay on my elders? And so I do want to say that um, the, the companies really did a great job in actually uh, having really diverse folks included. So we do know that it's actually safe for diverse racial and ethnic groups. We do know that Moderna and Pfizer are safe for folks 65 and older. Um, they did include folks of all sizes and weight, and they did include folks with lots of different um, underlying health conditions. They're now looking at um, some other more immune um, uh, conditions. So things like um, folks living with HIV are now being included in the studies. So folks who have um, compromised immune systems are now being included in the studies. So we um, we're just now getting that information versus, um, but we do know for diabetes, hypertension, asthma, heart disease, um, high blood pressure, um, you know, that folks uh, that these two are really safe. So to jump in, um, we're going to talk about the mRNA vaccine. And Eric, I'm going to hold off on your question a little bit just because it's sort of it's a little jumping past what maybe I think folks need to understand the technology first, and then we'll talk about the strains as well. Actually, let me like do folks already know this stuff? Do you want me to move on? Do you want me to explain the the mRNA technology and how it works? I think you should go ahead and explain it. I think that'd be good. Yeah. Just don't like to bore people. Um, so the mRNA vaccine, I, I want to be really clear, mRNA technology has been around for decades. So we've been studying it and using the technology for 30 years, um, and we use it uh, for, you know, for, for many other health conditions like cancers. Um, it's just the difference now is it's the first, and there's also been a, researching this type of vaccine for a decade. So the difference is that this is the first mRNA vaccine um, to actually uh, go through all the trials and be approved, and that it's specific to COVID in this in this turnaround. So um, the mRNA molecule uh, basically trains, uh, goes into the body. Uh, it disintegrates actually really quickly in the body. And you've heard in the news that these have to be kept really cold, that these two vaccines have to be kept very cold. And part of that is to protect the molecule and keep it from disintegrating. So when it goes in the body, it actually disintegrates pretty quickly. Um, but before it disintegrates, it, it um, makes a protein. 
So if you see in this corner, this is like the coronavirus, a drawing of the coronavirus, and it has these little spikes on it. And so the, what the mRNA vaccine does is create a protein on the cells that look like they mimic the spike. And so the body, your immune system says that's not supposed to be there, creates these antibodies to come out and, and to fight that. So our body learns to actually identify COVID-19 and fight COVID-19 and produce antibodies already waiting for COVID-19 without ever having to get COVID-19 um, in our bodies and without ever having to get an infection. Um, so, you know, uh, traditional vaccines work in a similar way, but they're using more of the virus itself to, uh, to help your body recognize the, that virus and your body then develops antibodies um, to fight it. This is using that mRNA molecule. People are really confused by the name of it and they feel like um, I get a lot of questions, is it gonna change my DNA? Um, so one thing to say is that this molecule, again, it, it disintegrates rapidly in the body. It, it, um, it, it doesn't penetrate the cell. What it's doing is actually creating this protein um, and it's not replicating the cell, it's creating that protein. Um, so, I like to be really clear, and you know, sometimes people say, "Well, how do you know that?" Um, and the way we know that is that again, this isn't new technology; it's just new that we're using it for a COVID vaccine. So it's technology that's been in the body and um, people's bodies for decades, and has and we've been able to research it. Questions about that? So um, it's replicating the the spike protein. Is that is that is that the idea behind the first it's one? Like mimic, it's mimicking it. Yeah. So what that it does specific is, protein though that specific antigen on the on the virus. It creates a protein on the cell that looks like one of those spikes. Do you and know so which which mimicking. which antigen? I'm sorry. No. Yeah. It's mimicking that protein. Um, and that therefore uh, allowing the antibodies to then, like training the antibodies really to uh, recognize COVID-19 because that's what it, it recognizes. I have a question. Um, I, that... I know it says your name is Lidware, but I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Can you turn your mic up? Um, oh, there you are, gotcha. Okay, I have a question about what you were talking about earlier about the mm -hmm. research for the different diseases and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I got my second vaccine um, Saturday mm -hmm. and um, I have cancer mm -hmm. and I'm really healthy except for that I have cancer at surprise but it's true. And, and, and so they ask you, you know, yeah. and the nurse there that gave me my vaccine told me that it wasn't going to be as effective on me, which I thought, and so that I, I would like to know if that's true. Yeah, I, and I haven't, huh? yeah, I haven't heard that. And I, you know, I mean, basically if, if somebody is, um, and I haven't heard that, so I would actually put that back to your primary care doctor or to that nurse and find out what. Well, what. I can't, I mean, that nurse is just somebody who gave me a vaccine. Yeah. But I thought it was absurd that she told me that. Yeah, she's and just I, somebody giving me a vaccine. She's not my doctor. Right. And that's why, you know, anytime people get very specific with me about a specific, like I have this and then this and then this medication and I'm like, talk to your, like that, you know, cause I don't know what you're, exactly. She doesn't know what, what you're, right. is. she doesn't know what you're, you know, like, I don't know why somebody, Nothing. yeah, I don't know why somebody would say that when they don't know anything about your actual health. Okay. So, I just wanted that valued yeah. val validated because I thought that 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 was I thought it was really unprofessional. Yeah, and then um and again, you know, I uh maybe I'm missing some of the research. I've definitely not heard that. Um but again anybody anytime people ask me about very specific, uh that's when I'm like, go talk to your healthcare provider. But without okay. knowing your specific, I wouldn't have given you that information. Okay. So. That's I just, <laughs> so yeah, I just, yeah, and I would check with your healthcare provider and I've done research around the, yeah, I mean, I haven't seen any of any, anything that tells me that, but again, you know, we're, we're still learning. Um, I, we said it, we, they studied, so Moderna and Pfizer um, studied, you know, specific health conditions and we are still learning about some other ones. 
for sure. That's what I figured. They, yeah. I, that nobody really has any substantial, solid information or on it, any particular. Well, that's what I think. I don't know. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, I'm not a medical person, but. Yeah. And I, again, I can't speak to her. I mean, what I can say is we, you know, we have some data that's coming out. Like, again, we're, they're now including folks in the studies um, who, you know, like I, I'm doing a presentation for folks living with HIV. And so I've been doing a lot of research around that to make sure I have all, you know, everything. And it's, it's rapidly changing because we're now including folks in the study who have, you know, immune, who are more immune compromised. And so it depends, again, what treatment someone's getting for cancer and what type of cancer and what their immune system. That's why right. I don't, I don't get so into the weeds when it comes into any of that, because I don't know your immune system and, and she doesn't either. So right. that, it's yeah. really complicated disease. Yep. I mean, it, it, you know, it's all exactly. over. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I just want to, no, I agree with you. Exactly. That confirmation. Um, yeah. Um, so I think Sam, were you starting to say something else as well? No, am I making that up? Not me. Nope. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Um, any other questions? Uh, you know, I will say people keep saying, um, well, this technology is so new, I don't trust it. And, and, you know, again, it's not new. It's been around for three decades. If folks want to wait for a more traditional vaccine, Johnson Johnson just got approved. Um, I mean, for me, I, you know, I worked in HIV treatment in the, in the late 90s, working with people with HIV and AIDS. Um, we said we were 10 years off from an HIV vaccine then, and we still don't have one, and that was late 90s. So I'm, a, I'm sort of interested in where this mRNA technology for vaccines is headed, because it's, um, you know, now that, yeah. So, Pat, you have a hand up. Yeah, I have a question about the vaccination. Uh, for people who already had COVID and they have natural antibodies, I get the first vaccination, but there's been lots of information now about whether they should get the second one. Yeah. I don't know if you have anything newer or... Yeah. So the, the recommendations haven't changed yet. What we do know is that folks who've, are, who've had COVID and specifically in the previous six months, um, because there's thought that you that folks have antibodies up to six months. We don't know how many because it seems to be different for, I mean, just like COVID is different per person, right? Some people have no symptoms, although what we're realizing is maybe people didn't actually realize their symptoms, but some people have no symptoms, some people have mild symptoms, some people end up in the hospital, right? So real range, unfortunately, some people die, like real range of symptoms. Um, and so we do know that there is some immunity build up. We're assuming, like not assuming, based on science, we we're thinking it's probably six months. We're still saying three to, to sort of make, you know, to to continue to do the research. Um, but, you know, we've also seen people get the infection again within those first six months as well. Um, so in terms, of, so the recommendation currently is still for Moderna and Pfizer is still two um, shots. I don't know if that will change. What we do know is that if folks have gotten COVID before, and especially if they've gotten in the past six months, um, they'll probably have a stronger, uh, I'm gonna pull this slide up, they'll probably have a stronger um, reaction to it because they already have antibodies built up. So sometimes what we see is, you know, folks have more like a higher fever or really tired. And so they have more of these side effects from the vaccine um, and especially on that second shot. So, so, you know, it's up to the person to decide, do they want to wait a few months? You know, I, they have to weigh it against the risk of COVID versus the side effects they're going to experience. Um, again, we do know people, do get it um, again, sometimes in the first three months and sometimes people seem to have more immunity in the first three months. So it just depends on the person um, and how many antibodies they have. So that, you know, again, so to, to answer the question, the recommendation hasn't changed, it might. Um, and people should definitely be aware that they may have more side effects um, from the vaccine because they already have the antibodies in their body. And especially again, the second shot is so the first shot, what happens is you're about 50% protected for Moderna and Pfizer um, after a couple of weeks, your antibodies get built up. And then the second shot, you're about 95% protected. 
uh, uh, protected, so you have even more antibodies build up, and that's why you're having these reactions. So people call them side effects. We really think about them as what to expect when you get a vaccine, because it's your it's your it's your immune system working. So Pat, did that answer your question? And, and I'll just add, just a specific to me, but I have been donating plasma. Yeah. I had COVID at least a year ago, but I'm still donating plasma, and I have high antibodies. Yeah. That's the natural ones. Yeah. And I did get the first vaccine, and I did have the side effects. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely. my debate now is given my situation. I still yeah. want to have the side effects again. Yeah. And, you know, again, because this is one of the things that becomes very unsatisfactory in terms of answers, like we know a lot and we're still learning a lot. So, you know, people have been frustrated for the past year because things have changed and things have changed because we learned things, right? So we used to talk about wear, like, don't wear a mask. And then we learned mask really works. And we learned that from science, right? And then now we're talking about double masking because we have um, hardier strains that they pass easier. So now we want people to have more protection, right? So things keep changing. And then the same thing with the vaccine, we're continuing to learn. And so the folks who were all involved in the study, they're following them for years. And then also all the folks who are getting the vaccine are, are reporting their, not all of them, we're hoping that folks are still reporting their side effects um, and the impacts of the vaccine. You know, there's actually a, a site that, um, that folks can report them on along with also reporting to their doctor. So this is where we're still learning. Um, so again, that, that I had seen the research you were talking about, and there's some conversation happening about one shot or two. And then currently, the, the recommendation is still for two. You know, again, and the other thing we don't know still is how long the immunities last. So we don't know either natural immunity or vaccine immunity how long they last. So people ask, you know, am I going to need to get a shot once a year, every two years? And it's a part that we don't know yet um, because we're still learning it. So same thing with many vaccines when they first come out, we say they last forever. And then we're like, now you need a booster, you know? And so this one, we're not saying that, we're just saying we don't know yet. And we'll, we're learning how long it'll last. And then if folks end up needing another shot, um, you know, a year down the road, or if it's two shots a year down the road, that's something we're gonna continue to learn. Um, in terms of these side effects, I do want to, you know, point them out and mention them. It's, uh, it's again, it's something that we think about as something to expect, not necessarily side effects. Um, some people get them, some people don't. Same thing with COVID and like the the response that people get. Some people have really a lot of symptoms, some people don't. Same thing. Um, but when people have them, they're normal. When people don't have them, they're normal. Um, I've definitely heard folks not have them and then feel like they didn't actually, they got like a placebo. So to be clear, no placebo is happening anymore. Like that's done. Um, people are getting the vaccine and some people just don't have side effects. Other people I've heard of um, way more intense side effects, which made me think, Pat, similar to what you were saying, made me think that that person probably had had COVID and maybe didn't know it because I've heard of some really high fevers and lasting a long time. And that's super rare. I, I mean, I just don't hear that very often. Usually what, I, what we hear and what I hear and what showed up in the studies is what, what we have here. So sore arm, some people say like, eh, it just hurts a little bit. Some people say like, I feel like I got, uh, uh, I have a friend who said she felt like she kind of got kicked in the arm by like a horse or something, like it just hurts so bad. Um, so it just depends on the person. Some people get tired, headache. Headache is a big one we hear a lot. Some people have gotten migraines, um, mild fever. And again, if someone's had COVID, they may have more extreme. Um, and then also the second dose, people usually get more side effects. Um, I have this severe allergic reaction on here because folks have heard so much about it. Um, I do want to say they're really rare. Uh, we, heard it, we heard it with the Pfizer vaccine, but we know that Pfizer and Moderna are almost identical. They're super similar vaccines. Um, so we've had millions of doses um, given. We know of 21 severe allergic reactions that happen from them. None of those folks have died. All those folks are fine. Um, but the big thing we let folks know if they've ever had like severe allergic reaction in the past, whether it was to a vaccine or not. And the severe allergic reaction would be um, like trouble breathing, your throat closing, heartbeat weakening, like a life-threatening severe response, an allergic response. Um, then they want to make sure to tell the provider, the person who's giving them the shot, uh, that, that this has happened in the past. I would recommend if someone has an EpiPen, bring in your EpiPen, um, especially if, it, if you're getting it at a pharmacy. I've definitely heard of folks um, at pharmacies 
turning people away if they didn't bring an EpiPen because they're not a hospital. Um, and so they're not allowed to just give someone an EpiPen. Um, but again, in general, it's super, super rare. Ken, you had something? Yeah, I have a question. Um, I really want you to reiterate um, that no one has died from the uh, vaccine because there were reports out of Southern California and people you know, were repeating without yeah. validation that people had died. Yeah. And that's just not the case, right? I want to yeah. be very Correct. clear so about that. People you know, have died. So there have been no links to the vaccine. And again, it's continuing over under research and scrutiny, right? But um, we've had no folks, I mean, people die after getting vaccinated. People die after walking out of their house, you know, like lots of things. We don't have any deaths linked to the vaccine. And these reactions were specific allergic reactions that folks had. And again, they did not die, but that was because they were, you know, in, in with the healthcare provider. So that is, you know, one of the reasons we say, if you had this ever in your life, as a precaution, we want to make sure folks will tell the provider. Um, and that way, what, I mean, in general, what folks are doing is monitoring. Usually people are being monitored for 15 minutes after a vaccine anyway. Um, that's what I keep hearing from everybody. Um, his and getting them. And that's what would happen here as well. If someone has ever had this type of reaction in the past, they would want to um, be monitored to make sure everything's okay. You know, the other thing to say is um, there's no, there's no egg. Like sometimes in the past people had allergic reactions to the vaccine because of the ingredients in it. We're going to talk about the ingredients in it. Um, and I, I can even show you all 10 ingredients in the Pfizer vaccine. I mean, they're, uh, they're definitely really different than other vaccines in terms of like much more limited ingredients and there's no like egg in which you know some people have had allergic reactions to. And then I had a question directly to me that said if someone gets no side effects does that mean the vaccine is, isn't working as well? And no, I mean all of this research you know folks had a whole varying degree of you know out of all the hundreds of thousands of folks who participated in the studies folks had whole varying degrees of side effects, but we still found it to be 95% effective after the two doses. And again, when we came into the call, actually, Ken, you had mentioned getting vaccinated and someone said, oh, does that work right away? So I do want to say like, no, it, it does take a couple weeks for your body to build up the antibodies. So it's not just like you get the vaccine and you're like, I'm ready, right? Like it's, you're still, uh, it, your body still needs a couple weeks to build up the antibodies to be able to protect um, against serious illness and death from COVID. And then there's a question in the chat, clinical trials on children are just starting, so children won't be vaccinated for a long time. While younger children don't seem to get seriously sick, some kids do get the MIS, a multi-inflammatory syndrome, after sh uh, uh, aftershock, and they can spread disease. Why is, there has why is there any hesitance at all to require that all teachers be vaccinated for returning to on-site learning? Yeah, the hesitance is um, that we don't have it. So the whole reason why that the vaccine tiers exist um, is because we don't have enough vaccine to vaccinate everybody who is even currently eligible. And, you know, I get the weekly reports basically, and I'm part of weekly dist vaccine distribution calls. And, um, you know, like one week we'll have 240,000 el people eligible and, and 12,000 doses. Like we just, we don't have it. So um, that is part of why it is, um, why there's tiers. And so there's a lot of debate on who should be in the next tier and who should be in this tier and who should be in that tier. And, you know, that um, what I do, can tell you is what it was based on. Um, some of it was around CDC recommendation. Um, and then uh, some of that is also around our recommendations around equity. And so making sure, you know, for example, the first tier of folks who were able to get it were folks who were living in um, elderly folks who were living in care facilities and rehab facilities. But what we also know is that many folks in King County are many elders are living and being in their family's home and being taken care of by family. So part of equity was also making sure that we can vaccinate those folks as well and not just the folks who are in um, uh, a care facility. So yeah, there's a lot of talk around, um, you know, should teachers be vaccinated? And there's a lot of talk about should folks with autoimmune, you know, disorders be, or caring for their children with autoimmune disorders or, you know, lots of different folks who should be vaccinated. And the tiers are really focused on who is dying. Um, and then also because we need care providers and lots of folks were leaving the industry and weren't, and we're quitting. And so we needed 
healthcare providers as well. So um, yeah, that's what I can say about that. Um, I, what the hope is that we'll get more vaccine and be able to get folks vaccinated. And it's true in order to protect children, the adults need to be vaccinated. Um, and to protect, to protect adults, the children need, need to be safe, right? And need to actually be wearing masks and face coverings and doing all the prevention pieces. So that's kind of what I can say about that. Um, again, and can, you, uh, can you touch on people who have like high risk jobs as in um, have a lot of like high contact with, you know, other people? Like, yeah. for example, like the U.S. Postal Office, right? Let's yeah. say somebody works for, you know, one of those kind of kind of jobs. Are they... Yeah. Are they kind of be like? Are they going to be placed in front of like your average person? So, um, again, so what I can do is send you a link that has all the tiers in it. Um, and and I will say it's there. I, I I am not a fan of our tiers, not the not the people who are being prioritized, but I just think it's a complicated chart. But you know, essential workers are next. But again, the essential workers are not it's not like everybody at once. Again, because there's such limited vaccine. Still have to prioritize in the essential work group and who is the essential work group and so um and so again the folks in the essential work group that will be next will be over a certain age and with specific underlying health conditions so um yeah and postal workers are actually a little bit further down on the tiers so yeah we're uh yeah that's what i can say about that uh, my partner is an essential play has an essential business and they're i think there are still two tiers down so um, it's really, again, focused on um, looking at communities who have been highly impacted. Look at the, you know, if you think about here in King County, who were the first, first, not just the first folks to die, if you think about the life care center and all of the, the folks who were living there, but also have continued to be folks who are highly impacted, have been elders in these care facilities. And then also thinking about communities who've been hit um, and who are, you know, what age groups um, are more likely to die or have serious illness and be impacted in that way. So again, the tiers are super unsatisfactory and, um, and that's what we have. Um, Eric, you asked about global tiers and equity and, and honestly, that's a whole other topic. I mean, in terms of uh, global, global vaccine and global care around you know, any vaccine, including uh, now COVID, we could talk about that for days and equity. Um, one thing I will say is, you know, having a one dose vaccine approved um, is going to be Johnson Johnson is, um, you know, if you think about here in the US and also globally, how hard it is to get folks two shots, um, that as long as uh, it, you know, as, as long as companies are creating it and also supporting countries who can't afford to buy um, these vaccines, that is going to be helpful, and especially a one-shot dose is going to be extremely helpful if you think about um, global global needs uh, and equity. Um, yeah. So is it happening equally globally? I, I would imagine that that answer is going to be no. Um, can it happen? Hopefully. Um, and, and part of why I say that is you think about who is getting it, it's a lot of the countries who bought it. Like, you know, again, we turned down $1.9 billion of the vaccine, that's why we don't have it. So the countries who can afford to buy it are the countries who are currently having it. And then hopefully that will also be, um, you know, folks will also have support in, in accessing the vaccine otherwise. Um, so a lot of confusion happens when people get the vaccine and they have these symptoms that look really similar to the symptoms you would have when you have COVID. This happens with the flu shot all the time where people get the flu shot, they get sick and they're like, you gave me the flu. <laughs> and so to be really clear, that's not what's happening. We're not giving people the flu. We're not giving people COVID. When someone gets a COVID vaccine, their immune system is, um, is, is activating. And that is what these um, side effects are. It's the immune system responding um, and your body responds in this way. Um, and again, some people get them, some people don't, but that does not mean you got COVID um, from the vaccine and the vaccine will not give somebody COVID. Big concern has been, um, how is it developed so fast? Uh, and so definitely like to you know mention that, that 
you know, one thing to think about is we're in a pandemic. And so there was a lot of money put towards it. Um, and that money was able to buy rent laboratories and pay volunteers and pay uh, healthcare providers. So here in like one example is here in King County, we have Fred Hutch. Fred Hutch has a global um, vaccine trial network, uh, including the local network that has worked on the HIV um, vaccine for many, many years. Um, and all of their laboratories pivoted and became uh, COVID-19 vaccine laboratories. So this is one of the ways that, that the, the vaccine was able to be developed fast, is that there was already all these networks that were already engaged in community and doing tons of amazing work in communities who already had trust built in community and was able to recruit volunteers. Um, the other way that this vaccine was able to be produced rapidly is that um, no skips were stepped. I'm sorry, no steps were skipped. <laughs> um, wow, no steps were skipped in it. Um, but what they did was actually put uh, two of the steps at the same time. So usually you go A, B, C, D. Here they went A, B, C, and D at the same time. So usually you're gonna do testing. Once the testing is complete and all the research done and everything is final, then the production happens. Because we were in a pandemic, this happened differently. So uh, Pfizer and Moderna actually created, and once the research was sound, they felt like it was going to be safe and effective, they started producing uh, you know, AstraZeneca did that as well. We don't have AstraZeneca here. Um, and they, they end up having to pause on it, even though they had already produced. So that's another thing to say is just because they produce things, if they weren't safe or effective, they're not going to be approved and they're not going to be distributed. So these Moderna and Pfizer were able to um, produce the vaccine at the same time that they were continuing the testing. And then the mRNA technology is actually quicker to develop because um, you don't have to culture the virus for a period of time. So all of that enabled this to get out into our community quicker than, uh, than originally what, we, what was being talked about. And I think that that piece is really important for folks to know, because in the beginning, everyone, you know, uh, the CDC and Dr. Fauci and federal feds and us, everybody was saying 18 months, and now we're a year, and we have a vaccine. So I think it is important for folks to understand how that happened. Um, I will say I was really skeptical until I got to read all the research and be like, oh, okay, <laughs> great. Now I'm less skeptical. Uh, and now I know how this all happened. But definitely um, it makes sense that uh, folks, you know, have questions about how it was developed so quickly. So I mentioned I was going to tell the ingredients. So there are, you know, there are very limited ingredients in both of the um, vaccines. I know Pfizer has 10. I'm trying to remember how many um, Moderna has. But the main active ingredient is the that molecule, the mRNA molecule. Um, and then all of the other ingredients actually are there to help help it work in the body. So there's fats in it. I want to be really clear, they're synthetic fats. So there's no animal, there's no human, there's um, there's no pork, there's no, you know, a lot of folks don't eat, eat pork for religious reasons or folks don't eat uh, certain types of fish or certain, you know, whatever, different things. Some folks are vegan, vegetarian. So the fats are really important. Um, they're synthetic, but they're really important because they create a little bubble around the molecule. That's what we turned off. Um, that protect it when it goes in the body. And then there are, are salts and sugar in it. Um, I want to be clear, someone has diabetes, high blood pressure, they're really small amounts of salt and sugar, but they both do, like everything in it functions for, for like provides a function. So the sugar um, keeps the ingredients from clumping when it's frozen. And then the salt actually helps the body recognize it as, because um, it matches our human chemistry. So if you think about your body, it's mainly salt, salt and water. And so it helps the body not reject this vaccine um, by surrounding it in salt. Questions? Um, how many failed attempts were there? No idea. I'm sure there were. I'm, well, I'm sure there were many, and I'm sure there are also many that will can, that will actually be approved down the road when they, you know, work it out. You know, and we also don't have failed attempts. We have other ones who are still going through the process, like Johnson Johnson was just approved, 
this weekend in the U.S. It's been approved in other places, AstraZeneca. You know, so we have other ones who are coming down the pike, um, and they weren't failed attempts. They were just taking a little bit longer in terms of the research and the the creation. Again, it's different to culture back, uh, virus versus MR creating an mRNA molecule. So, at one point, um, Becky, at one point there was a report that 170 different vaccines in the works. Um, yeah, I mean, I. Um, do you have any idea how many of those are, are progressing? I mean, I can Google that, I was just wondering from you. Yeah, I mean, I don't. There were, I, you know, again, everybody pivoted. Every single lab who was working on vaccines pivoted, which in some ways is great because we have a vaccine. In some ways, it leaves out, you know, it leaves malaria and uh, HIV and all the other vaccines that were in development um, hanging. So, you know, it, there's a plus and minus to that, right? Um, so I, I, uh, I don't know how many were in development. Um, and I do know that the two big ones, again, like which ones are coming, uh, Johnson Johnson just was approved. Um, and then AstraZeneca is the, the other one that has sort of made it pretty far and has approved in other countries. Um, I don't know when it'll be approved here. Um, so, and then does the mRNA already exist in the body or does it, vaccine deliver the mRNA that resembles COVID and the body reacts to that. Yeah, so the, MR, um, the, MR, the mRNA molecule does not already exist in the body. It is a molecule that is um, synthetically made that creates a protein on the cell that mimics the, the resemblance of COVID. So, yeah. Um, any other questions about ingredients as well? <laughs> Somebody asked me like, well, I mean, how does this work if there's, you know, every, like people are really about vaccines. Folks have lots of, you know, opinions around ingredients and like, so all of a sudden there's not things like mercury in it. And people are like, well, how is it going to work? <laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute, do you want mercury in it or do you not want mercury in it? So, I mean, the thing I like about it is that you really get to see how, these very slim ingredients and that they all function to make this successful in the body. But I have had some pretty funny conversations around it. Um, so common questions we get, is there a chip? Um, the answer is no. Is there a tracking liquid? The answer is no. How do we know that? Because one thing to say is not only have these vaccines been studied, um, you can imagine these vaccines have been under intense scrutiny. Um, globally. And then they've also been, all of the research has been under um, independent review. So folks don't have to trust Pfizer or Moderna or Johnson Johnson. They don't have to trust the federal government or the CDC, right? There's all these other, like our state, the Department of Health and our public, local public health, who I work for, have all also done their own independent review of all the research before allowing it in the state. And many states throughout the country have done the same thing. So there's been a ton of independent review on them as well. So how do we know it's not in there? Um, you know, the list of ingredients, also, um, you know, the independent reviews. A big question I often get is, is there fetal tissue in the vaccine for, for moral or religious reasons? A lot of folks um, oops, uh, really want to know if there's fetal tissue in the vaccine. The answer is no. Um, and then also, I think it's important to mention that the Pope has actually sanctioned this vaccine. So that is something that is often helpful. Um, when folks are Catholic, if they know it, is it okay to get this vaccine? Um, also, again, no pork products, animal products, no egg. Um, so the vaccine is halal. The vaccine um, is vegan. So all of these things that people are often very concerned about. Questions on that? All right. So we've talked about a little bit about this. Can children get vaccinated? And we already mentioned that and the answer is no. I will say, so the vaccine is approved for folks 16 and over. Um, one of the vaccines is 16 and older and one of them is 18 and over. So children 16 and up can get the vaccine. Um, they did not include children under 16 in the study. You can imagine why. Um, it's not usually gonna be tested on children first. Same thing for folks who are pregnant. Um, the difference is children cannot get the vaccine. They are uh, now, um, they have now opened the age to 12 to 15 year olds can be involved or involved in the study, so people can volunteer 
convene the studies from ages 12 to 15, obviously with parental consent or guardian consent. Um, and then once we know if it's safe and effective, then that will go through its approval process and then it'll continue to be tiered. So it's not like they're gonna start on two year olds next week, it'll go 12 to 15, and then I'm assuming probably three year tiers, but I'm not positive. Um, can folks who are pregnant or lactating get vaccinated? And the answer is yes. So it hasn't been studied on folks with folks who are um, pregnant and back, uh, sorry, lactating. Again, there's no virus in this, so we're not, you know, it's not going to pass virus through breast milk. Um, the big thing I let folks know is that it, it, the folks who are pregnant and breastfeeding or chest feeding uh, were not involved in the study. So it's really up to someone to decide for themselves that they feel comfortable getting this vaccine if it was not studied on someone like them. Um, that said, we've had lots of folks since it's been approved all over the world get vaccinated and be lactating and breastfeeding and chest feeding. And there's, again, the research continues to show that it's safe. Um, we don't know if it'll, you know, with other vaccines, we know that, um, that uh, antibodies can be shared through the breast milk. Um, uh, and we we don't know that yet. Um, so we don't. That's another thing we don't know. If someone is breastfeeding or chest feeding, and they've had uh, they have the antibodies, can they pass them? And we don't know that. Um, and then, sorry, I keep putting your pictures in front of me so I can see you all because <laughs> I prefer to look at humans in my own slide, but then I can't see the slides. Um, and then, so can you? And we've already talked about this next one. Can you get vaccinated? Um, Maybe you've already had COVID, so we've already talked about that. The answer is yes. And then I like to be really transparent about the stuff we don't know when we're still learning about the vaccine. So again, I mentioned we don't know how long it'll last. We don't know, you know, when it'll be out for children. Um, another thing that we don't know is if people getting vaccine, if getting the vaccine will prevent somebody from actually getting COVID. What we do know is it prevents death, serious illness, um, hospitalization. We don't know if someone comes into contact with COVID, will they get COVID? Will it stay in the body for a period of time? Um, can they pass it? So, you know, when they were doing the study, they weren't, they were studying the people who were getting the vaccine. They weren't studying all the people around them to see if they were getting COVID. So now they're actually doing studies to, um, so we can learn that, but that was definitely not the focus. So that's why we do talk a lot about you know, even if people get vaccinated, they need to still continue to do all the prevention things we've talked about. Um, it's because we don't know yet if it will prevent passing it or prevent someone from, from getting it. Um, and then I did want to show this. Um, we just hit, um, uh, I believe this weekend, we actually administered our uh, 500,000 dose in King County. So again, we don't have nearly the vaccine we would like to have, and yet we're very excited to have administered 500,000 doses. Um, uh, we're a little higher than the national. Nationally, I saw the other day that about 15% of folks have been had received a dose, um, have been vaccinated, and you know here it's uh, closer to 18%. So we're a little higher than national, um, but uh, again, not nearly the amount of vaccine we would like. And then all of this data can be found on our website. Again, I'm just showing like one, I literally took a screenshot and honed it to this one little corner, but we have all of this data and more. You can break it down by geographic or geography. You can break it down by um, uh, demographics. So, and see who is getting it and where and how. Um, not really how, I guess we know how. Um, and then who can get vaccinated? So here is the, the um, like where we're currently at on who can get vaccinated. The thing that's been really confusing to folks is this whole um, multi-generational household. So people heard multi-generational household. And um, I don't, you know, a lot of a lot of it wasn't qualified. So it went out on the news and it went out on the whatever and none of it was qualified. And so yes, it is multi-generational gener households, but it's specific. So it's multi-generational household, someone age 50, caring for an elder who cannot care for themselves. Um, so that is the important thing to know. Um, and then I have some questions. 
So the common cold is a coronavirus. Yep. What is the likelihood that we'll see a spinoff effort to vaccinate against the common cold? I think we're likely to see a lot of uh, efforts in terms of the mRNA vaccine. I mean, they're looking at it for, uh, I mean, I've seen a list of other ones that folks are looking at. HIV is another one that they are looking at this um, uh, technology for as well. So yeah, I think there's a chance that we're going to see the um, mRNA vaccine, um, mRNA technology looked at for many other um, illnesses. I don't know that the cold is going to be, and, and I know this is just a spinoff question because it's coronavirus, but you know, usually they're going to focus on ones that are going to be life-threatening to, to many folks. Um, so HIV or malaria and you know, looking at other um, illnesses like that, again, thinking globally as well, uh, like the HPV vaccine, it was uh, HPV was one of the leading, uh, which leads to cervical cancer. It's one of the leading um, causes of death of women in the world. And so that's where that focus came from. So like thinking about, you know, which, which, uh, yeah, which vaccines focus, uh, folks are going to focus on, but I do think that the mRNA, I don't think, I've definitely seen there's a lot of interest now in looking at the mRNA um, technology for other vaccines as well. Uh, I don't know why I have two of these, so that was two. And then who can't currently get vaccinated, and again, this is going to probably be changing, and I mean, I can't say when, but probably soon, in the next few weeks, um, we'll probably be at another tier. But again, it doesn't mean we have the vaccine to meet the need, unfortunately. Um, but we know that um, currently folks who are younger than 50 are not eligible. Folks who are younger than 50 and caring for a partner or friend versus, you know, an, a, a family member. Um, what what folks are calling kin, I think, to be really clear about that, that relationship. I find it really funny. Um, but to get very clear. And then um, an older adult, adult who was able to live independently and taking care of their, their children or kin. Um, but again, anyone over 65 is, is eligible. One of the things folks see sometimes is that, or have seen maybe is that some of our uh, original, when we stood up our mass vaccination community clinics in, in South King County, our clinics originally were for 75 and older. And the reason was that that was um, folks who got COVID who are 75 and older had higher, um, much higher death rates and much higher hospitalization rates. Um, and now that has changed and we are now doing 65 and older. Um, and part of that's an equity issue as well. Um, so I want to, sorry, I'm looking at the question. My mother is 70 years old and has some medical conditions. I was gonna yeah. touch really quick on the, uh, in terms of that you know, the person just posted the longest post. It's kind of like, People like, you know, in the hospital, right, and the doctors, they have to kind of weight the pros and cons of whether or not if it's really suited for the person. Like, if it's really 50-50 chance, right, meaning, like, if they get the vaccine, they can die. If they don't, they can still die, right? That's when it's really up to the patient. So th that is one of the most difficult situations. Yeah, and so, Peter, um, yeah, thank you for, you know, saying that. I, I mean, I would say we're not in a 50-50 situation, right, when we're talking about the COVID vaccine. I do think people do need to weigh the risk of getting COVID and, and, that, on their, um, and that on their health and their life, right, and also checking it anytime people have severe um, health conditions that they want to, I, I would absolutely recommend them checking in with their health care provider and seeing, you know, uh, for some folks, this is going to be amazing because it'll really help prevent them from getting something that would, that could possibly, um, you know, hospitalize them or make them really sick. Um, you know, like I have a family member with, with um, severe um, emphysema and has had it for years. And so, uh, you know, she's also like has a lot of other health ailments, but that emphysema was way more risky, right? Of her getting COVID and having already this like severe lung disease and we knew it was safe for this lung disease to get the vaccine. So I do think um, for um, for James who, who posted in this, I think it's a really great question and definitely talking to our doctor and finding out um, how you know specific to her condition. But again, what we know about the vaccine is it doesn't give people the virus. Um, you know, most people do really well with the vaccine. Um, and I would just check in with her healthcare provider. 
And then any efficacy studies of the vaccines? Um, uh, yeah, so no, they haven't. I mean, as far as I've seen, what the focus on currently is around COVID-19. That doesn't mean they're somewhere they're not also looking at. I'm sure there's places where folks are looking at it. I haven't seen any of that research, so I can't speak to that at all. Um, the research that I know about is these vaccines specific to COVID-19. Oh, I'm sorry, James. Yeah, I know, and your question was just fine. Um, so yeah, let me show you how we can find a vaccine. That's a great question too. So um, it, it is hard. I will say, I'm gonna pull up my phone because someone just sent me a great website um, the other day and I was like, this is a great website. I don't know why I can't share it. Uh, I, I'm supposed to be sharing FaceFinder, but uh, I, uh, I like this website a lot. <laughs> so I'm gonna add another one in the chat to everybody. Um, and it's a website, so if folks are eligible, so you have to be eligible for the vaccine, um, but it will actually show you who has the vaccine. Um, it updates every day, people update it. Um, so uh, like uh, St. Joseph's and Franciscan and pharmacies. Um, so what I'm here, this is, our, this is what I'm going to show you is like how to find out if you're eligible um, and then the web website I just put in is a great website to find out who has the vaccine. Um, so there's a few things people can do to find out if they're eligible and then how to get an appointment. Is they can call their healthcare provider or their doctor to see if they have appointments. I'm going to tell you that's probably rare. Um, most healthcare providers are not currently having don't currently have the vaccine. Um, there were doses that the federal government just released just to pharmacies. So some pharmacies actually may have it now. So I would say also call your pharmacy again if you're eligible and see if they have it. How do you know if you're eligible? Um, this findyourphasewa.org website is great for that to find out if you're eligible. It also is currently, it's currently in multiple languages but really hard to find. So when you go to this website, what you find is English and Spanish. So also this phone number, um, 206-477-3977 is a number that folks can call and state, like if they need one, um, let's say someone's um, mom is looking this up, but she doesn't really, is not great at using the internet. Um, like my mother, it would be much better for her to call, whereas I would look on the internet for her. Um, and that's what we've been doing. So I would also recommend for folks, if they need a phone, phone number, this is a phone number to call, but also this is where folks can get um, interpret get interpretation in all languages. So that's where this number is also great. And then the link I put in the website is a website um, again that where to find who actually has the doses available. Um, if that makes sense. So James, that actually would probably be a helpful um, place to start um, if looking for vaccine like actual doses. And then also this phone number, folks can help on that. That's our county phone number, and people can help there as well. But also getting on the list, like if you have, you know, get on the list of your pharmacy and get on the list at your doctor's office, because again, in the meantime, you're on the list. Um, and what happens if people are eligible and they're on the list, um, when people don't show up for their shot, they go down the list and call. So I know everyone's heard about all these folks who've gotten these vaccines, who aren't eligible because there's been extra doses. So I want to be clear, that's rare. It's, it's not like... Uh, not as much as the news has sort of made it out to be. And when these vaccines are defrosted, they will go bad. Um, and so they do have to be put into an arm. And so what we do and what every, the city of Seattle and Franciscan and all the healthcare folks do is they have a list and they go down the list and they call people as folks are not showing up for their appointment to make sure they get the spots filled. And if there are ones at the end of the night and the folks who are working there or other folks may get that vaccine that's not as common what is more common is they're going to go down the list and call people so that's why i definitely recommend like if you're eligible and you have an appointment in three weeks get on the list um and that way i've known folks who you know had appointments like i have uh, i know some folks who were had appointments in three weeks and they just got a call this weekend and, and were able to get the vaccine because people didn't show up for their appointments um james did that was that helpful Oh, yeah, sorry. I see your your uh, your message. And then the really early on, oh, I think it was Eric who was asking about the the strains and how they respond to the vaccine. So 
sorry, that's my cat. Um, so to be clear, and you all, I'm sure, know all this, that we expect that uh, viruses to mutate, viruses mutate. Um, one of the problems with um, here in the U.S. is that we, the, the federal um, and the, the previous federal administration wasn't funding testing for the strains. So like the U.K. and Brazil and South Africa was doing great testing. The U.K. were like meters in testing strains. So they knew exactly what was happening um, and what strains they were getting in, in the U.K. Unfortunately, we didn't have as much information. We knew we were getting it was inevitable we were going to have mutations. We knew that was happening. When they were being identified in other countries, we assume we probably have them here. Um, we know that we do now have two here. Um, one of them is the one that people usually refer to as the UK strain, and the other one people that refer to as either South African or um, Brazil strain. So um, we have identified them in King County. The problem with them is that they pass more easily than other ones. So they're um, they're like hardier viruses. They um, so it's not like they're going to pass longer distances. Um, you know you don't have to you know now stay 10 feet. So the same rules apply around prevention, but they spread easier. So what we see is when one person gets it, they spread it to more people than the previous strains, um, which means it's going to spread more. The way that we prevent variant strains is we slow down the spread. So the more prevention, the less spread of COVID-19, the less variant strains we'll have. That's just how the, the viruses work. Um, so what involvement does public health have with corporate pharmacies like QFC and delivering vaccines? Yeah, we're, we, uh, we don't have involvement with the, like the federal government was the one who made the decision around distributing to uh, pharmacies. Um, so that has not been part of our, like we're not involved with that. What we have done is partner with, um, uh, you know, other uh, organizations. We also have like a whole equity um, contract that we have with other organizations um, to help distribute um, the vaccine, I want to say, when I say other organizations, you know, one of the things that we're doing is many different, um, uh, uh, many different uh, modes of getting the, the vaccine out. And I see Peter, you say USC doesn't have it. I think that was just an example of you know, pharmacy. Um, so, you know, our, one of the things we're currently doing is, um, you know, we train firefighters to go out and actually distribute the vaccine to uh, to people instead of, you know, having to expect elderly folks coming to a place. Um, and so, you know, we were able to get it out of community that way. We have mobile clinics. We have, um, we've been doing some pop-up clinics and the city has been doing pop-up clinics in, um, with, with uh, I'm sorry, we have not been doing pop-up clinics yet. We are in the process of, we would like to be doing some pop-up clinics um, when we get the vaccine. The city has been doing pop-up clinics with, um, you know, community organizations who work with communities who have been highly impacted. Um, so there's a lot of different modes that we are at the county are involved with. We've also advocated the community health centers did not get a lot of vaccine, and we have highly advocated to the state that they get more. Um, so you know, we also are involved in some advocacy in that way. Uh, so going back to the strains, um, you know, what we are seeing, oh, I thought I deleted that, is that um, actually it looks like Moderna and Pfizer um, are, are doing pretty well around these new variant strains. Uh, definitely we've seen that around UK variant, um, and we're seeing studies that suggest um, antibodies being produced against the ones, um, the other ones I mentioned, the South African one that we also have seen here. So the big thing to say is, you know, we need more research. These two specific vaccines seem like they're effective. The thing to keep in mind is they're still COVID. So that is where um, we're seeing it still be effective. So even though they're different strains, they're still COVID-19. But again, we need to monitor that before we can say absolutely whether or not these are going to be effective against these new strains. Uh, the research is looking good so, good, so far, which is great. Um, but we don't know for sure. And so that's when we get into all of these continuing to do. Um, I know, Ken, you had a lot of questions uh, when you and I were chatting beforehand about like 
if you get vaccinated, you still have to wear a mask and white and two masks. And, you know, and the answer is yes. You know, again, we don't know um, if someone can get COVID after the vaccine. We don't know if they can pass it. We will, we are learning that. And again, the research is looking really good, but we don't know definitively enough to say. Um, the reason we're talking about the two masks now is um, specifically because these variant strains uh, and they pass easier. So it's like that's some extra prevention. Either way, the gators that are one little, one layer, you know, we've always recommended two or more layers. It needs to fit well, it needs to be worn properly. Um, and then again, continuing to do all these other pieces as well, washing hands, cleaning surfaces, um, not touching your face, staying home when you're sick and not going to work, but also like staying indoors. And then of course, getting tested as soon as possible when someone's exposed to COVID or has symptoms. I've definitely seen people be like, oh, I just have a cold. I'm like, so you're getting tested, right? Oh, it's just a cold. So you're getting tested, right? We have all these free testing sites all over. Uh, yeah, so getting tested even for mild symptoms, super important. Uh, and then getting a vaccine when you're eligible and when they're available. So I do see there's a couple more questions in the chat. Folks are going back and forth about QFC a little bit. Did you explain or can you easily why the, the variants spread more easily? You know, that's an awesome question that I think we need more research on um, because I've been looking at that exact thing. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I can't say definitively because I think we need more research on it. I mean, my understanding is that there are hardier viruses, but uh, I don't know exactly what that means in terms of, like, do they last longer on surfaces? Uh, are there more about, you know, like, I, so I can't answer that definitively because I'm still waiting for that research. Um, you know, uh, one of the things I think about is like HIV and hepatitis B, two different viruses, uh, two different viruses, but they spread the same way. Hepatitis B is 100 times easier to get because it's a hardier virus. So, you know, we see this a lot where, um, and the difference is these two are the still COVID-19, but different strains. So I don't have a great answer for that. Um, and I wish I did because it's something I've been like, uh, I knew somebody would ask me one day um, and I don't, I don't have an answer for it. Um, what, what risks, although low, do you think someone that's pregnant should be aware of is considering getting the vaccine? Um, and that is a great question. I think the thing to weigh is, you know, how likely are they to get COVID? What is their concern about getting COVID? Um, especially are they going to be in a hospital? You know, like, I mean, people don't always know when they're going to end up in the hospital with a birth, but, you know, chances of being in the hospital, we definitely see people getting COVID in hospitals at times. So I think the big thing to weigh is um, the person's comfort with getting this vaccine, knowing that other folks have been vaccinated, we haven't seen a problem with it, but also knowing that it, folks weren't included in the study. And then again, weighing it against our risk of getting COVID. Um, and then why is the state versus King County eligibility criteria for who can get the vaccine different? Um, it's mostly not different. Um, places where we have differed a little bit is places where we are trying to be more equitable in distribution. So if you look at who is um, more, uh, more impacted uh, around COVID, uh, and uh, uh, so here in King County and nationally, folks who are um, Black and African-born and African-American, folks who are um, Indigenous, folks who are uh, Latinx, have much higher rates of death, um, much higher rates of hospitalization, serious illness, and all of that, you know, I want to be really clear that's not because people are doing anything wrong. It's, you know, based on underlying health conditions, it's often a result of racism. And so um, when folks have these underlying health conditions, um, they are not going to do as well with COVID. So that's where we see higher rates of death and hospitalization. Um, so, so the places where we have differed has been around equity and trying to make sure that all communities have access um, to the vaccine. So one example I used earlier was specifically around, you know, folks, uh, elderly folks being cared for in homes versus elderly folks being cared for in facilities. And we know that uh, folks from BIPOC communities have much higher rates of caring for elders in their homes. And so that's an equity issue. So that's one example. Um, 
Avoid touching face in public, even if it itches. Wash hands first before scratching. I've seen so many people reaching into their mask. Oh yeah, absolutely. Did I not have that on here? Um, you know, and one of the things I do when I'm trained, I'm in my home. I wash my hands a hundred times. I sterilize my desk, and I still like, like I, I, anytime I have an itch in my nose, I'm like, don't scratch it, don't scratch it. You're modeling bad behavior, you know. So I mean, even here, I try to avoid touching my face to, you know, not to model that well, but yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, you know, it, it used to be, I would say, you know, in the past, like that's not the main way that it's passed. And that's true, it's not the main way, like touching an object and touching your face, not the main way people get it. People get it from close contact with someone else, from droplets from their mouth or nose, but with new, more contagious strains, you know, I'm gonna be even that much more careful with touching my face. I'm gonna be that much more diligent washing my hands and doing the, you know, alphabet song when I do them, I actually count to 20 every single time. <laughs> but I think the alphabet I just, uh, I was going to ask something really quick. Like is, sometimes like, like, honestly, some of my patients ask me like, okay, don't reach into the mask when I have an itch. Can I slap my own face? And when I ask them, what do you mean by that? He's like, well, I'm not going to reach into it, but I'll touch the outside surface area of my mask, you know, just try to like kind of punch my face to get the itch away. And I'm like, no, just don't touch your face in general. Don't touch your face with your hands. Yeah. I mean, you know, you can do a little like this or something, right? But you just don't want to touch your face with your hands because our hands touch everything and the everything, the railing outside, the, the doorknobs, right? Um, so yeah, absolutely. I love that. Do you want to smack my face? I mean, that would, this sounds like a dangerous move in lots of places, lots of ways, but yeah. Um, yeah, and that, uh, and especially, you know, again, mouth, nose, eyes, these are ways in for viruses. So, um, you know, those, and the same thing like glasses, like people touching their face with their glasses or wiping their eyes, like, you know, again, this is not the main way that COVID is spread. I would also hate for someone to get it that way. So, and especially with these new variant strains, absolutely. All right, I wanna show you now I have an itch, of course, that always happened now that we talked about it. So our website, this is just one, um, one of our websites. This is our specifically our vaccine website. Um, and I actually am going to take us here because we have some amazing, I'm very, uh, am I not going to take us here? Thank you. Um, you know, I feel like the, um, the county has done a phenomenal job around language access and that we are actually have learned from this a lot around equity and language access and we are going to continue actually having all of this language access um, available after COVID. Um, so I do want folks to see that our vaccine website has, you know, currently 18 languages, um, but we also have information available in more languages. So I'm trying to find oh, which one to click on. I believe it's this one. And it, nope, not the one. Well, maybe it's this one. Yep, there we go. So um, so again, if, if you're working with folks in any, you know, in communities that need information in any of these languages, um, we have these posters also in more than 18 languages. Um, the, this presentation we have translated into 20 languages. We present them sometimes in language, sometimes um, like we have one happening soon in Somali. Uh, sometimes we have them um, done and then interpreted into, um, like we did one the other day, it was interpreted into Mandarin. We have the PowerPoints available. So for folks who can read in their own language, we have it visually in their language, um, and then we have them interpreted. So we really have been trying really hard to make sure that folks are getting information in language and in the languages they need. And then our main COVID site is available in, mm, that's not the site I wanted. Uh, you can see it's available in uh, 30, on this left-hand side, um, 33 languages so far, um, including having um, ASL and materials for folks who are deaf and blind. We also provided, uh, I did training of trainers for folks who are deaf and hard of hearing and deaf and blind. So really trying to make this information accessible. So I'm showing you all this to, to share with communities and with like with folks you know who may need all this information in these other languages. Um, and that is the end of this presentation that I have up here, but not the end of our conversation if you would like to have more.
Hey, can you quickly talk about people who are trying to debate with themselves whether they should, you know, desanitize their own groceries when they get it from the stores, right? Like, so talk about that because because a lot of people are, you know, debating with themselves. Yeah, you know, the big thing is um, a lot of that's been disproven that really what people need to do is wash their hands. So, uh, you know, when they bring in their groceries, they put their groceries away, they want to wash their hands before making their food, before eating. Um, when I get my mail, I open it all up and then I wash my hands, right? Um, so it, we don't have to be washing everything down when it comes in the house. And a lot of, again, a lot of that's been disproven, but really wanting to make sure that we're cleaning high touch surfaces. You know, um, when folks are, especially living in multi-generational households and living with someone who's an essential worker or, or in general, someone's partner works out of the house, um, you know, and, and they come home, it's great to, or they come where they live to, to take off their clothes, throw them in the laundry, throw them in the wash, throw them wherever they put them somewhere else and go take a shower. So they're not bringing the virus into their home. Um, so those are all reasonable things that, that people would like, uh, would be useful to do, but wiping down every item of grocery um, is not necessary. We also know that like food items is not necessarily how, or is not usually how these things are going to be passed, how viruses are passed. So you don't have to like scrub your orange with, you know, soap and water, but definitely, you know, washing your hands is for 20 seconds with soap and water. Doesn't matter the temperature of water. I've actually had people ask me the exact temperature they need. Lots of good studies have showed it doesn't matter. So uh, 20 seconds, soap and water, sudsy soap, water temperature is fine. Um, the one thing I will say about cleaning products is they're all different. Um, and so it seems really silly to say, read your cleaning product, but uh, some of them you spray on and you leave and you let them dry in the air. Some of them you spray on and you wipe off. So it really also depends on that product. So definitely go ahead and read them um, because they're all a little different, which is also interesting. Um, Oh, I love that someone said they were feeling hopeful. That's awesome. And by um and that they'll be eligible by summer. Yeah, I mean our hope again, our hope is that we'll have that um, you know, majority of folks who are eligible to be vaccinated, so over 16, and want to be vaccinated, um, will be vaccinated by we're hoping by the end of summer. Again, that's not everybody, that but that's the majority. So um you know, we feel hopeful about getting more vaccines now that more are being purchased. Also, Johnson Johnson was just approved. So it, you know, it seems like we should be getting more. And the more we get, the more available it will be everywhere, right? Not just with us, but with, you know, again, the private companies and doctor's offices. I mean, the, the more the better um, for folks who want it. I will also say, you know, I'm definitely not here to convince anyone to do anything. Like my role is very much, you know, share information and people can make their own decisions. Um, and some people are going to decide not to get vaccinated, and that's totally their decision. Um, and, you know, that's part of informed consent. Yeah, thank you, Peter. You, uh, Peter put in there in the chat about the alcohol wipes. Yeah, in the beginning of the, vac of the virus, when um, of COVID and the pandemic, when, um, you know, everybody was out of all the wipes, we, I definitely have slides to tell people how to make all their own home <laughs> solutions because you couldn't find them anywhere. So I love that I don't really have to show those anymore um, because for the most part, you can get these now, but I'm hoping that I won't have to show them again. Ken, you were gonna say something. Yeah, so um, just wanna verify that for those who've had um, both um, shots, we still proceed as if nothing. It just, you know, wear the masks, don't have your groups, stay safe, wash your hands. Just pretend you never had those shots that. in the first place for the indefinite future. You know, here's the deal is that everyone I talk to who's doing it is like, I know I have to keep doing all these things, but I feel so relieved anyway. <laughs> so hopefully getting the vaccine will still give people some relief um, emotionally. But yes, until we know more, uh, you know, until we know more, until more people are vaccinated as well, um, you know, we're, we're saying we need to be especially diligent now because of the new strain. So not even just diligent and continue with the prevention, but with the new strains, especially diligent until we know more. Again, the research is looking pretty good around it, but we just don't know. And so based on, you know, the limited studies, we, we can't make any decisions around that. Uh, do, hand sanit do, uh, do you wash hands with too much sanitizer because you can get dry skin? Yeah, or don't. Yeah, you know, um, Hand sanitizers, uh, 
I, you know, there's so, it, all of it so harsh. But, I mean, I wash my hands 20 million times a day, like I'm sure all you do, and the hand sanitizers, and we could talk about, you know, how awful it is for our hands. Um, you know, and in the past, we've always said don't use, hand, like, hand sanitizers because bacteria is good for our bodies, but the problem is that this virus isn't. So that's why the switch, right, that we want people washing your hands and using hand sanitizer because even though some bacteria are good for our bodies, uh, these viruses aren't, and this virus, sorry, isn't. Um, so, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, uh, where hand sanitizer comes in handy is in between washing, like when you don't have access to a sink. Like when I come out of the grocery store and I get into my car and I wipe everything down, <laughs> including my hands, and, you know, that's where the hand sanitizers come in handy. When you're somewhere where you can wash with soap and water, that's, you know, going to be the better method, but they're both. I shouldn't say better method. That in you know in healthcare we say healthcare settings you can use hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer so many times and then you got to go wash your hands with soap and water. So and also petri like uh, in you know like in top institutions in the states like when I was at Johns Hopkins they actually did the uh, under the microscope we put we would put two petri dishes just next to each other. Right, you had what this is what happens when you don't wash your hands. Actually, three of them. Here's what happens when you just use hand sanitizer, and here's what happens when you use soap and warm water to wash your hands properly. Right, and then you would, you know, three different scenarios you would touch a clean, like white piece of bread. Right, and then after about you know five days, you could see clearly like the clear difference if you wash your hand with soap, nearly no bacteria, hand sanitizer, surprisingly, there's still a lot. But if you don't wash your hand, you touch the bread. Five days later, it just becomes black. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, I'm about to eat dinner now. Mm. <laughs> but Peter, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh wait, there is a question. I'm sorry. Um, thanks for the helpful answers. When we're if the vaccines are that good to protect us and numbers are improving, when do you see relief in the phase lockdown, shutdown, constraints? we are under now and um, it, it will never be perfect. Yeah, I mean, COVID's never going away, right? Just like lots of things are never going away. Um, you know, we know uh, we're currently in phase two. Uh, we have remained in phase two, which is great. Um, I know folks are not happy that we're not in phase three, but I'm happy we didn't go back to phase one because um, we squeaked by to get to phase two. Um, and we only got to phase two because uh, the, the restrictions sort of um, relaxed a little bit. Uh, we only had to meet three of the four metrics instead of four of the four. That's how we got to phase two. So I, uh, you know, again, we're thinking the end of summer is when those people who want to be vaccinated will be vaccinated, that will have enough vaccine. Given the new, again, you know, Johnson & Johnson being approved and 200 million doses being purchased by the federal government that may be quicker and may not, but the metrics still have to be going the right direction. So as long as people continue to be diligent in prevention, not have social gatherings and barbecue, I mean, summer is going to be, spring is going to be just like the holidays. We, you know, were tricky and we definitely saw uh, cases rise in the holidays. You know, we're definitely concerned about spring and summer and folks, you know, ignoring all the precautions again, because it's nice out. So Fingers crossed, um, as long as folks continue to do what we all need to do, then things will continue to open up. Um, and it's specifically based on mes metrics. So, um, you know, I did a, when we were at the height of this, uh, when was this, like in January? Um, so that wasn't very long ago. And our numbers were, it was either the end of December or early January. I did a, a, a podcast for some young people. Um, and they said, you know, what's your worst case scenario? And I was like, I don't know, I think we're here, right? Like at the time we were at the highest numbers, we had shut down our economy. We had, you know, at the time, 35% of small businesses in Seattle had closed and yet we were at the height of the numbers. So the fact that we are headed the right direction is, is hopeful, um, but obviously it's still devastating financially and devastating for small businesses and businesses in general. So. Hopefully we keep going the right way and the lockdowns and the shutdowns and the restrictions will ease up. And that's all I got. Um, I wish I had a, a more definitive answer, but it's all based on metrics. Any last questions from me or any additional questions I should say from me? OK, 
Ben, how are you feeling over there with your, with your second Yeah, I was just reading <laughs> for the, the unmute. This has um, been great, Becky. Um, I want to make sure I can get a uh, point to that presentation so I can post that. Um, oh, yeah. And um, it usually takes me a couple of days to get the video uploaded to our meetup.com site. Um, but this has been fabulous. Um, you've answered a bunch of questions I had, and um, I want to thank you uh, for your time and all of you for attending. Um, so if anyone has any last minute uh, questions, now is a good time to jump in. And I'm um, looking through the chat to see if I missed anything, just to make sure I didn't miss anything. But I don't think I did, but if I did, please speak up. So, uh, so I have a, um, I've been putting off haircuts for a long time. And I have an appointment in two days, having just had my second shot. Um, and of course, I'll still be masked up and stuff. But should I put it off for another two weeks? Um, <laughs> so that's up to you. Personal comfort. Uh, <laughs> we can talk about my roots right now. And, uh, you know, <laughs> so totally up to you. Um, oh, somebody is, is, Dave, you're here from Arizona. Oh, Hi, Dave. I'm, I'm gonna, a little jealous about that. I'll be coming back to you, Dave. I know. I was like, wait a second. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's totally up to you. Again, uh, you know, I would actually recommend double masking, to be honest, um, yeah. while you're while you're doing it, because again, that's real close contact, uh, more than 15 minutes, depending on your haircut. So, double masking would be a great idea. And they're going to help me. So. Someone from Arizona. What? I didn't. Yeah, can you repeat you that? Have, you said that? Yeah. Anyway. Dave, did you have something? Dave and Marilee? Oh, no. Or, okay, I was trying to find out from Ken what the URL is to where he'll post that recording. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I'll put that in, in um, chat. Um, this is one of my masks. Yeah, I love those. <laughs> you got to have fun, right? Yeah, anyway. I love those. Um, yeah, I'll put this on the... Spy um... spy. Do you remember Spy versus Spy? Yes. <laughs> That's what those remind me of. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, we'll put that on our meetup.com page and let me grab that. Um, Can you put that URL in the chat for folks? Yeah, I am pulling it up now. Oh, there's one, uh, one little thing, I guess it's, I guess a lot of people don't think about, but it's, it's kind of something that we need to keep in mind that if you, let's say you sit in a public area, right? Let's say a doctor's office or, you know, like a haircut place where other people have sat. And let's say you don't bring like a certain sort of like a paper towel to sit on, right? You just have your own clothing touching, um, you know, those those chairs, public chairs. And then you sit in your own vehicle, right? By the time you get back, that's where the 75% alcohol wipe comes in handy. So I, I always actually just wipe my driver's seat just so the virus is not, no longer there. So we, we transfer that from our clothing to our cars. Yeah, yeah. Everybody used to look at me um, very funny when I would get on a plane and wipe everything down. And now I'm now I'm just one of many. <laughs> now now I'm great. I'm no longer the weirdo that does it. But you so, you were doing that yeah. before the the COVID. You were um yeah, being I in a, your business, you were much more aware of yeah. um yeah everything that can go on. Yeah. Yeah. My partner also got a really horrible flu once while flying. So it was like we're done with this. Just wipe everything yeah. down. I feel like my my inner germ phobe has had time to really be free during this time. So get to embrace it. But Peter, that's a good reminder. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, thank, well, you Becky. thank you all for attending. And, I just pulled uh, up your spy versus spy picture. That's great. <laughs> okay. And um, um, I hope that some of you will stick around for future presentations on totally unrelated topics. Um, and also let me know if you have ideas for topics. Um, in fact, I've been exchanging email with someone to talking about astronomy and uh, wants to know if there's a particular area of astronomy. Uh, I'm jumping. <laughs> I'm going to go eat dinner. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, thank you all very much. We're going to wrap it up. It's been a um, um, bit you of fast two it. hours. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, done a uh, bit of fast two hours. So thank you very much, Becky. Thank you, Susan. Of Buskin, if you're still on there for helping put this together and Peter as well. And um, I think we'll call it a night. So. You can yeah, uh, just uh, last but not least, last but not least, I posted a link to it's, and it's not necessary at all. But like if anyone who is really willing to try it because they're such a germaphobe, that video shows you uh, how to clean your hands, like basically exactly how a surgeon would. So <laughs> you can guarantee your hands will be very clean afterwards.
if I watch that, I probably will never not do it. So I'm going to refrain. Probably don't watch it then. Well, it's going to cost you five minutes every from day. a long line of germ phobes. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> It's in my it's in my blood. All right, bye everybody. Thank you so much right. for having me. Thank you all. Thank you, Becky. Thank you, Peter. Thank you all. And um, we will call this a night and um, see you all hopefully next month. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye bye. Hey. Hey, Dave. How are you feeling? Hey. I'm feeling better, as you probably know that I did have COVID nineteen, and yeah. boy, was one heck of a big deal for us here both my wife and I had come down with it and it basically took me down for the month of December and January I was you know convalescing more or less but uh I feel a lot better now oh good good well we can talk about um scheduling a presentation from you on the day yeah, yeah. I think that'd be great um power um power and water management on that kind of scale is, is fantastic you know just an amazing topic so um um we can pencil you in now for i think june or july um if you're up for it um but we can be in touch oh yeah yeah no i'll i'll be up in oregon at that time i uh i spend my summers up there because summers down here in arizona and i lived down here for 28 years i mean it's just, it's just like being exiled to I guess the uh, like uh, like being in hell. So <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, where, where in Oregon do you hang out? Uh, I have a place up in John Day, Oregon, in Eastern Oregon. Oh, Eastern Oregon. Ah. Yeah, and actually, it's in a little town called Canyon City, which is a ghost town, which is where they had a gold discovery. And uh, my home is actually right where the the gold was dredged out of the creek. So. Uh, um, you know, it's kind of an interesting deal. <laughs> wow. Well, yeah. Cool. That's fun. That's fun. I'll, I'll, I'll send you an email, uh, yeah. you yeah. know, and yeah. kind of detail it all up. Yeah, not, not that, but uh, the presentation. Sure. Yeah. Appreciate that. We can get that scheduled. Great. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, okay. We'll talk later. Okay. Take care. Okay. Bye now.